Hi everybody, this is Ellie Medieval Embroidery and I'm Alexandra Makin. And today I'm going to do something a little bit different. I'm actually going to give you a presentation um, discussing some of the results of analysis I undertook on the Marseille embroideries that are now housed at St Catherine's Church in Marseille, Belgium. Um, if you like this sort of presentation and you would like to see more in the future, then please let me know in the comments. Also, I'm thinking of doing some live presentations. So if that's something you think you'd be interested in and there are topics that you would really like me to discuss, then let me know again in the comments below. In 2014, I was given permission to examine the eight early medieval embroideries housed in the treasury at St. Catherine's Church in Marseille, Belgium. It was very exciting. The pieces were taken out of their display case, but due to the way they've been preserved and um, sewn onto conservation fabric that's been wrapped around specialist boards, only the front of each piece could be studied. Even so, the analysis produced interesting results, some of which I'm going to share with you here today. The eight embroideries were discovered applied to what is now called the casula of Saints Herlindus and Relindus, two sister saints who founded an abbey church in Aldeneck, Belgium in the 8th century. However, the embroideries date to the late 8th to 9th centuries and were applied to the composite casula at a later point in their history. The composite textile was found in a reliquary on the 2nd of September 1867, but it wasn't studied in detail until the Belgian textile specialist Marguerite Kalberg published an article on it in 1951. Kalberg dated the embroideries to the second half of the 9th century and gave them an early medieval English origin. Then, between 1979 and the mid-1980s, the embroideries were studied as part of a British Academy-funded project. This resulted in the publication of four articles by Mildred Budney and Dominic Tweddle, detailing the historical and art historical context of the textiles and a technical overview of the embroideries' materials and construction. And then in 1984, Mildred Budney also published an article placing the embroideries within the early medieval embroidery context. So today I'm discussing the arcade and roundel strips together because they're so similar, as you can see from the images. The two bands that make up the arcade strips aren't complete, being cut down at some point in their life. And as such, each survives as a slightly different size. Uh, this may have occurred when they were applied to the casula. Each band lie on either side of the composite piece with the ends butting up against one of the four monograms and it's possible the strips were cut to allow for the precise space needed for each monogram. The monograms are not all the same size and the bands seem to have been fitted between them with some precision of forethought. The roundel band was found sewn across the middle of the casula. When it was taken off the textile, it was discovered that the embroidery was actually made up of two separate strips, um, which were unpicked during the conservation process. All the design elements on both the arcade and roundel strips were embroidered in couch gold, while the background, which is a riotous combination of red, blue, green silk threads, was sewn in stem stitch. Areas such as the line of the arches and roundels were originally accented with pearls and although they are now missing, um, the thread that held them in place can still be seen as lines of running stitch. <clears throat> although the arcades look as if they have survived quite well compared to the roundel strips, microscopic images show that this isn't the case. Budney and Tweddle observed that the ground fabric on both sets of the embroideries was an undyed tabby weave linen made from Z spun thread. That used for the arcade bands is finer than that of the roundel strips, being constructed of 24 by 26 and 26 by 20 threads per square centimetre, respectively. This made no difference to the stitch work with stitch lengths that I've measured 
varying between two and five millimetres on both um, sets. The use of two different fabrics therefore points to batches of fabric being stored and used as required. On the arcade strips, the design was laid out on the ground fabric using a single strand of red silk. Bunny and Tweddle point out that the design of the roundel strips had been transferred in the same way, stating that the colour of the thread used was beige, but my microscopic image shows that they're actually pink. It may be that the thread um, was originally the same colour uh, as that used on the arcade strip, but in some areas it's faded over time, giving this change of colour. Once the design lines were complete, the silk embroidery was worked. This is evidenced on both the roundel and the arcade strips by a number of silk embroidery stitches passing over or piercing the design thread. But whether the whole strip was worked from start to finish or in smaller sections like, can't be ascertained from the available evidence. We really need to look at the back to get that sort of technical information. The silk threads on both sides of the embroideries were made in the same way. The red and, silk, um, the red and green silks were Z twisted and on occasion S plied, while all the other colours were untwisted. Bunny and Tweddle state that the silk embroidery was worked in stem and split stitch. Uh, however, my analysis and the microscopic images show that both the arcade and roundel strips were embroidered in stem stitch only. <coughs> On the arcade strips, the stem stitch is worked in two forms. In one, the direction of each stem stitch line faces the same way. In the other, alternate lines of stem stitch mirror each other, forming a chevron pattern. Apart from the borders, where the lines of stitching form mini chevron shapes, there seems to be no formula for the combination of straight lines or chevron patterns across the embroideries, uh, nor in the colours in which they were executed. A combination of approaches can also be seen in the filling stitches. Most of the already transferred gem-like motifs were individually outlined in stem stitch with the coloured silks before they were then filled in. This meant the original shape of the motif was maintained throughout the working process. With small motifs such as triangles, the shape has been kept whilst it was filled. However, there are other examples where the stitching has been randomly placed with priority given to filling the space. And then again, other areas such as curves have been embroidered with lines of stitching that easily filled the space, while motifs that contain gradual decreases in area were filled with stitches worked at different angles following the shape of the narrowing space. The use of colour was purposeful, with bands of different shades being worked within one motif. And this would have given the arcade a slightly different, more riotous look to the roundels, where motifs were embroidered primarily in one colour. On the roundel strips, the stitching tends to follow a set pattern. If a shape is obliquely curved, as with the roundels, or straight, as with the outline border, the line of sewing will follow it. In smaller, more confined and oddly shaped spaces, two working orders were identified. And in one, the motif was first outlined in stem stitch before the filling was worked and from the outer edges towards the centre. This was completed in a more random fashion with the priority being given to filling that space rather than keeping the formation of um, the shapes. In the second method, the filling seems to have been stitched first and an outline which then formed the shape was completed afterwards and other disjointed working practices can be seen when one block of colour changes to another in the same area. In the majority of examples the working line of the stitches was constructed from one colour to the next however there are a small number of instances where a change in colour has led to a change in stitch direction. The most obvious explanation is that a number of workers completed different parts of the embroideries, leading to small technical differences, but no overall disjointedness in the appearance of the finished objects. Um, and there may be um, an idea that the change in stitch direction um, altered the way 
that particular section looked um, but because the um, the shapes are so small um, that needs to be investigated really through some experimental archaeology. On the roundel strips many of the motifs will work within their stitched design line leaving the thread visible between each section. On roundel strip one the green, blue and beige yellow threads tend to be sewn in lines of stem stitch that all lie in the same direction while the red thread formed a chevron pattern. There are occasions when the beige yellow silks have also been worked in this way. On the second roundel strip the red thread was worked in both forms while the green was only sewn in lines lying in the same direction and the beige, yellow and blue silks were used to create a chevron effect. Again, the reason for these changes is ambiguous uh, with there being no obvious stylistic reason and it may indicate the hands of different workers um, but again experimental embroidery may uh, draw out more nuanced understanding of this um, Although it is possible to formulate the overall working order for each embroidery, the microscopic images indicate that sections were worked as blocks of colour being used when needed. As the mosaic design of the backgrounds involved the use of many different coloured threads, it's not unlikely that one motif was stitched and the thread was then left hanging loose until it was needed again, or that all the areas of the same colour were worked in one phase. Um, the first option is actually a similar working method employed on the Bay of Tapestry, um, but again, um, you, we need to be able to see the back in order to determine um, which type of method was, more, was used or was more predominant. Once the silk embroidery was complete, the gold was couched in place. Uh, this is evidenced by couching threads catching the stem stitches. The gold appears to have been laid out in the same manner as the silk, outwards, inwards. Um, again, this would help keep the shape of the motif being stitched. The couching is not as neat on the arcade strips as on the round or bands, and this could be due to a lack of experience by the worker and or the awkward angles of the shapes being worked. The couching has been sewn in two variations. While there seems to have been some attempt at bricking, as seen on the Durham stall, the majority of the couching has been constructed in simple lines, in some cases, individual couching stitches have been doubled, with the thread being passed over the gold twice instead of the more usual once. There's no apparent reason for this, and the technique doesn't give a decorative effect because the couching thread is so similar in colour to the gold itself. Um, but again, an experimental project may um, give us some more insight into these nuances. Um, and I should point out that we're talking about minuscule designs here um the each roundel on the roundel bands is 3.5 centimeters in diameter and each roundel band the whole band is um 19 centimeters by 18.7 centimeters um, compared to the arcade strips that are um 63 centimeters by 9.5 and 66 by 10 centimetres. So you can see we're talking about very small areas um, of embroidery and decoration here. So overall, it appears um, that the workers were concentrating on covering the space with gold rather than decoratively filling it with couching um, and patterned couching, as you can see, for example, on the early 10th century stolen manipul that were discovered in the tomb of St Cuthbert at Durham Cathedral. The couch gold thread has been worked to a good standard, but the layout of the gold shows variation in skill levels. Where the gold lies in straight lines, the threads tend to be placed close together. When the gold is turned, round and acute corners it is on the whole bent with precision however when the gold is couched over a more fluid shape um, the rows aren't as worked as closely together and the bends tend to be spread further apart um, leading to the conclusion that the workers were not as adept at filling um, these sorts of spaces and interestingly where 
there is some variation between the two roundel strips. So um, that may suggest that different workers um, worked on each roundel strip. In comparison to the arcade and roundel strips, the four monograms survive in the worst condition. The embroidery on the monograms was stitched on a tabby weave linen fabric of 24 by 20 Z spun threads per square centimetre. And um, each monogram, although slightly different in size, measures approximately 12 by 13.1 centimetres. The um, tabby linen fabric was painted blue. And Budney and Tweddle note that only the upper surface of the fabric contained pigment, which was indigo. Um, if the textile had been dyed, the colour would have permeated through the fibres to the reverse. Um, hence the reason we think they were painted. As with the other embroideries, the design was laid out in a running stitch using a single strand of silk thread, um, and this time either a white or beige colour. The designs consist of foliage and fretwork motifs that have been filled with couch gold thread. Only the backgrounds have been embroidered in red, yellow, green and blue silks. Surrounding the whole design are narrow borders um, from which very little stitch work survives. Running along the very edge of the embroidery, situated along the fold of the ground fabric, is a line of stem stitch worked in red silk thread. Once the embroidery was complete, the monograms were cut out and the edges were turned under and hemmed in place, creating the finished lettering. And at some point, a backing was attached to cover the reverse and hide the edges of the ground fabric. Due to their poor survival, it was difficult to gather data through visual and microscopic examination. Um, the evidence gathered shows that technically the embroidery on the monograms is very similar to that on both the arcade and the roundel scripts. However, there are a number of differences. The order of work is the same as on the other embroideries and as with the roundel strips, the outline stitches that denote the design um, have not been sewn over. The use of stem stitch seems to have been kept for creating chevron patterns instead of a combination of chevron and parallel lines. Bands of colour were worked in single motifs, as seen on the arcade strips, but whereas the embroidery would now follow the shape of the motif it's filling, on the monograms the embroiderer has concentrated on filling the area. The gold was couched in place last. In places, the gold has been quite accurately worked, with corners being bent sharply and precisely, and individual rows butting up against the previous one. However, there are other areas where this is not the case and the workmanship is not to the same calibre. The couching was worked in the same method as on the roundels with a single couching thread sewn over the gold each gold thread. Generally, the workmanship on all the embroideries is not as high a standard as that seen on the Cuthbert embroideries. Uh, with stitch lengths varying quite dramatically in early medieval terms and the couching being more basic, that is it, it's been used to fill areas rather to add, than add that extra decoration that you see on the Cuthbert Maniple and Stole. Even so, the pieces are of good quality, being worked in fine and expensive materials to an overall um, small detailed scale that is basically astounding to the modern viewer. And the roundel and arcade strips have a fluidity that's lacking in the rigidity of the um, Durham style and Manipal. And, and I must point out that um, when I'm making these observations, I'm talking about very, very small distinctions between the two groups of embroideries. Both of them are worked um, to a very high technical standard and the quality of them is um, fantastic. It's outstanding, really. The inconsistencies in workmanship may be seen as a number of different embroiderers working as a team to complete the bands um, and the monograms, um, with each probably having set amounts or areas to focus on. This, combined with the batch-like use of materials, points to an organised 
possibly workshop setting, where sets or groups of embroideries were worked at the same time and embroiderers were expected to work where needed. Therefore, these embroideries are an important addition to the technical story of early medieval embroidery, as well as being beautiful artwork that can inspire us today. So thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed that presentation. Um, as I said at the beginning, um, if you've got any questions or comments, please put them in the comments box below. If there are any other subjects you'd like me to present on, again, add those to the comments. Um, and also, as I mentioned at the beginning, about the live presentations. Thank you very much. See you next time.